And welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode 256. My name is Brando, and I guess shame on me. I was, I don't know, a little Jewish guilt was thrown my way that I didn't get our guest on, David Wilde, on earlier. Or did, am, I, am I misreading that? Because David, there's a preface of just how this happened, and I'm so honored that I get to speak with you today. Uh, our, I guess our mutual friend, Matt Wake, from al.com he retweeted you because you were you're casting your vote or you just casted your vote for the grammys right yes i actually just i just took it to the post office so yes i have voted the post office okay nice that's nice to see how things <laughs> thanks yes. work. uh so he just retweeted that and obviously the which we'll get into i guess the not the grammys i'm sorry the rock hall or was it the rock hall the grammys that you you was the tweet Oh no, I was, I, I believe I, I just finished writing and producing on the Grammys last week. This was, and I was waiting to vote until I was, my head was That's clear it. from that. So yes, I then finally sat down to make my vote. There you go. Cause basically if you don't know, uh, which we're going to get into, David Wilde is a, a longtime journalist who, who now is an award-winning TV uh, producer and writer who just, as you just mentioned, wrote and produced the Grammys, which we'll, we'll get into. But the, the tweet that I, I, I'm mentioning is uh, the, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame vote. And I think I, all I did was just retweet you. I, I, I didn't, we weren't following each other. I, I don't know you personally. You didn't know me. I don't uh, know me personally either. That's fair enough. That's how, that's how elusive I am. I know. Like, like Axel during Chinese democracy. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Uh, that I, I guess, and I said Soundgarden. That was it. And next thing I know, you're following me and then you inbox me and like, hey, I I listen to the show. I like it. I'm a little surprised you haven't invited me on early or earlier. So I was like, oh, OK, wow. I was just gifted this amazing conversation. So David, well, no, thank true. you. I, you have, I don't know what episode you said earlier, but uh, I've listened to probably 200 of the two. What is it? How many have you done? Are you serious? Uh, yeah. This is 256. And uh, my favorites, by the way, are always the women, like the background singers and musicians who work with them, because like there's always this undercurrent of like they were such lovely boys, <laughs> which <laughs> which which and Axel is a lovely young. It was a lovely man. And the truth is, that's my experience for virtually all of the time. But no one would believe you. No one would believe you that they're a Menchie band. They were like a great <laughs> group of young lads. Now, that doesn't mean they weren't, you know, smacked out of their minds, some of them at certain times. But even then, they were a pretty lovely group of guys that changed my life. And so yeah, I'm, I'm, I, those are always my favorite episodes. But yeah, at a certain point, I think maybe 150 episodes in, I was like, how come I never have been asked? Because only because I think that interview, what's funny is at the time it was like, it seemed like, you know, he was about to put out a record. <laughs> Instead it was, I, I don't even know the, I think it was like another seven, eight years or whatever. This is, and, and, cause I don't want to lose it. The, the interview we're talking about that you did with Axl Rose from yeah. Rolling Stone came out 2000. And a few things I want to mention and cause, oh my God, I, I read, reread it again today. That Axel at the time was 36. I'm 37. So just to think about the Axel Rose at my age is, is just blowing my mind. But yeah, 2000, and you uh, quite quoted not just Axel, but our friend uh, Doug Goldstein, and thinking that you know, it was just around the corner. The music's done, 80, vocals are 80% done, thinking you know, it's for summer release. Eight years later, it would come out. I heard the record. I heard. I, uh, I heard an album, and uh, but yeah, let me give you the background, if that's okay. The background Please. is like that was actually just a big moment in a long relationship. That uh, I was the music editor at Rolling Stone when Guns N' Roses hit, and to give credit where it was due, uh, I'm not like I'm. I'm more of a Stones kind of guy than I'm not at all a metal guy. But my assistant at the time was a, a woman named Kim Neely, who went on to become a writer, especially in sort of the hard rock world. And she said, David, you got to check out this Guns N' Roses, like the, when the record came in. And I, I really liked it. And especially because I'm a song guy, when I heard Sweet Child of Mine, I was like, well, where is, where is this guy coming from? So when they ended up you know, on the tour with Aerosmith, like I think I'd done the cover story on Aerosmith for Rolling Stone. Okay. 
And then I was invited to go to that show and I was brought back to meet them at Giant Stadium. And I looked up, you know, to try to like keep track of my life. I like uh, looked at some of these dates and it's all like, I realized what a big part of my life this band was. But so I went back and met them and I loved Axel from the moment I met him. To be honest, at that moment, that was when they were being kept separate from Aerosmith, who were trying to keep clean. Right, uh, right. And they were the, you know, they were exploding, the opening exploding act uh, on the bill. And they were exploding in many ways because virtually no one in the band was capable of speech except Axel. And he, you couldn't not have a great conversation with him. I remember vividly, we immediately bonded over our love of three bands, the Raspberries, who were my first band. So the power pop, like defining Raspberries, <laughs> Nazareth, who okay. to this day, I've always said, you know, that's where the biggest vo vocal influence on Axel that you never really hear about, mm. you know, and it was interesting that he had that incredible run, successful run with ACDC, because to me, I, you know, I grew up as a kid loving ACDC and Nazareth. And to me, Dan from Nazareth is like Axel's, like the most direct uh, antecedent to Axel's vocal <laughs> style. And then we both love the Pet Shop Boys to show oh, his range and also his interest in sort of electronic textures that would figure later when you get to Chinese democracy. But we just had this incredible conversation while everyone else was sort of nodding off in the dressing room, like literally, like, I mean, they couldn't speak. Uh, and then, so that was the first meeting I ever had. And I just loved the guy. He was, you know, the thing that never comes across in the legend, other than on your show, to your credit, like some of the people who played with them, you get that, how he was, you know, because there's all the loaded stuff of like, was this lyric show he was a racist or that he was a psychotic guy or whatever. The truth is one-on-one -on -one to talk to, in my experience, he's like a lovely guy, a wonder, like really smart, not from a background that, you know, I think from a rough background and I don't know exactly what traumas happened, but you could feel he's a guy who'd been through a lot, but had a lot to give and a huge talent. So then that was the first time we met. Uh, I, will, I will ignore that. Uh, cut to, that's right. It's uh, Axel. He hears you. Yeah. Oh, believe me, that's possible. <laughs> he's like, stop uh, talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. In fact, I was going to do this in my backyard and I had a flashback to being in my backyard, being interviewed about Axel and Guns N' Roses by Jake Tapper, who then was at VH1. There's some VH1 Jake Tapper special from like 2006, where Jake sat in my backyard asking me tough questions about Axel. So that's very possible. <laughs> that's I think so he weird. was mad about that one. Okay. So, so cut to the next brush was like, uh, there was a Rolling Stone party. And now, so now, Guns N' Roses are the biggest band in the world. And there's a Rolling Stone advertising party that none of the writers are at. And Axel is, I guess, walking in the village past the Ritz, I guess it was. He rushed into a Rolling Stone party and in front of like a thousand advertising people, the biggest rock star in the world went, is David Wilde here? I like that dude. So for that next month, I was like considered a cool guy, which has never happened before or since. <laughs> so that was the beginning of like a sort of the moment when Guns N' Roses were just ruling the world. And I assigned a cover story. And then the craziness started, which was, and again, it's the craziness that came from the band, but also the craziness of the desperation to profit from the band. Because Axel and the management and Doug, we should, you know, I'd love to talk to Doug about this because I always says, got along great with him. He says hello. He says hello. Oh, good, yeah. Yeah. I think we always had a, you know, good, we always got along great. I'll give you a, he said, give him my number. So, okay. Afterwards. But, Doug, <laughs> uh, but, but Doug also, and I think this would be interesting to get his perspective. I think they were starting to have to communicate some crazy stuff. Like at a certain point, it was like, Axel doesn't want a writer from Rolling Stone. He wants, uh, you know, Del James to do the interview. He wants Robert John, people like in his camp to write, take the pictures. And to be fair, I think because the first issue maybe sold 
huge amounts, we probably gave in to too much of that. But the relationship with Rolling Stone, and and if I'm telling you too much of this, you can stop me, but at the relationship with Rolling Stone. No, you're of, fine. Unless you, yeah. you would be the one telling me to stop. You know, if you're okay. telling me too much. <laughs> no. So re, re, uh, eventually it reached a point where I went to cover the band at Rock in Rio. Uh, and this was the original sort of the later, latter day of the original sort of guys, you know, where Slash was still in the band. I think okay. it was sort of the end of, as they were beginning to fall apart with the, you know, the sort of big version of the band with background singers and all of that. But I went to Rock and Rio and that was the point at which the band announced to interview us, you have to sign this paper that says, if you use a quote, we get quote approval. And if you use a quote we don't like, you have to pay us, I don't forget what it was. It was like $100,000. It was something that literally no journalist in the world could ever sign. And if I only wish if I could go back in time, I would have, you know, and I think we probably did try to explain, you can't do this. You'll never talk to another journalist. But that sort of was, I do remember being in Rio and I think slipping Axel a copy of a Nazareth record I found in, uh, uh, in Rio, like some import or something saying, I'd love to talk to you, but I can't sign this contract. And uh, so that was sort of a moment where things went off the wall a little crazy for a time. And eventually that was the beginning of the band falling apart. Cut to many years later, not many years later, but a few years later, uh, I guess it was, I got to look up when this was. Now we go to the White House. Because I have uh, 1999. You have notes, uh, I see. Yeah. I, I, well, I wrote down the dates so I could try to keep this together. Great. Because <laughs> uh, Axel likes to be precise. Uh, 1999, I'm writing a White House special for Bill Clinton called Concert of the Century. And it's like this one of the craziest days in my life. I'm Because, hey, I, I think it was my first White House show, maybe my second. But when you're a writer writing for the president of the United States, it's a big deal. Like, uh, I can't comprehend it. Yeah. I wrote a bad joke for the president uh, about us playing saxophone. I remember, <laughs> uh, El, uh, Eric Clapton pissing on the white house because he didn't want to have to find a restroom. It's, it was a lot of stories. Oh, nice. Okay. But it was at that moment, that day, uh, when I got a message, Axel wants you to call, uh, this number. And I, I remember walking off the White House lawn into the BH1 trailer or whatever it was and making this call wondering what Axel would want. And it was a woman who wanted my birth date and wanted to run uh, to see, just astrologically uh, check something. And I'm not, you know, it's not, I know I'm a Sagittarius, but that's about all I knew. And then I got a call saying Axel wants you to bring, to come to his house for Halloween. And uh, I hadn't seen him in years, uh, but I mean, I, I did love the guy in every dealing, you know, early sure, on. And, sure. uh, I was at that, at that moment, I was like, been married a few years. I think we just had our second kid. And I think they knew that. I think they might've asked like what my family was. I took my wife, I think my probably three-year-old son and my one-year-old son, and we drove to his house. <laughs> or, and I don't know how much this has been written about, but he did these charitable events for kids uh, at his house where he threw, and whatever he didn't get in his childhood, this is just like the side of him that was so great. He just brought kids from all over, and I think from... I'm not sure what groups, but he gave them a dream party and uh, it was fantastic. And I think I knew a few people there, a few other musicians and record company people. Uh, but I do remember vividly thinking it'll be good to see him because I hadn't seen him in years. And eventually he only came out in a pig costume, <laughs> a very professional pig costume where I couldn't see him. He could see me in whatever I was probably wearing a Dodger hat. You know, I don't know if it was not much like of a, uh, like a Peppa pig or like a real looking pig, like a horror story. kind it of. It was pig. a it was not it was not a scary pig to an adult. But I do remember like one a cute of my little young, pig. 
like a cute What's little, like, like a cute little, like onesie kind of costume. Of a pig no, no, axle. it was ornate, like Hollywood costume, and he could see me through the eyes, but we couldn't like see a mascot. Him. I'm thinking, uh, yeah, okay. it was sure, it was, or, it was ornate. One of my sons cried at the <laughs> afraid of a of a of a big pig. Giant. My other son loved it, and then uh, we got home, and I got a message, uh, and I do remember my older son who's now you know graduated college i called to ask him if he remembered this he goes i do remember the next day he went daddy i'm going to go back to axles uh <laughs> and uh i said i don't think we're going to have the inv invitation but i did get invited to go to rumbo studios a few days later or a few weeks later which was the studio in the valley i had been to and it was famously owned by the captain and Janiel. Like it was, uh, it was like a the 70s. captain and Tennille. Yes. Oh, yeah. Like love will keep us together. <laughs> sure. Captain and Although love did not keep them together. No, uh, it did not. <laughs> uh, no, and I had just worked with the captain wow. on the Jenny McCarthy TV show where I brought him in to play piano with the dead the presidents of the United States of America. If you remember that band, I do. Peaches. But absolutely. They said we need a keyboard player. I said. I think I have the captain in mind. What a sentence you just said. Just wow. A lot of <laughs> but okay, now, now we get to the strange part. Okay, I get the message. Now. <laughs> yes. I get the message. Okay, show up at I, I guess it was like 1 a.m. Show up at 1 a.m. That's Axel will probably get there around then. And I showed up at Rumbo. I think I ran into, or maybe it was sort of this was uh, arranged. Jimmy Iovine, who was running, you know, uh, his label, basically, because Interscope had sort of, I think, been transitioned into being part of Interscope. Geffen was now, in, I, I'm not even sure how that all, it all is a blur, like so much. But in any case, Jimmy Iovine was there. And very, you know, a, 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 he's a no nonsense kind of guy. And he was like, uh, yeah, yeah. I said, he goes, you're going to hear the record? I go, yeah, yeah. He goes, oh, yeah, I just heard a few things. He goes, he, and I remember what he said to me. He goes, it ain't Guns N' Roses unless Slash is there. And that was the, you know, the sort of bit of reality before I spent a few hours with Axel where my, again, the guy, there were so many interesting things about that night. And it all was, again, happening in the middle of the night. So it's like one, two in the morning. And the first thing is when I see him, this unbelievable thing that happened that doesn't happen in popular culture. This was one of the world's most famous guys, but there had been so many years when he had been out of sight right. that he had, he'd become an, he'd gone from being this kid, this rock God kid to being a guy who was in his thirties. Like, uh, you know, he, he was, he had become, you know, he didn't look the same because he had grown up. Uh, he didn't look bad, and I'm sure I looked nothing near as good as he looked, but it, he had changed, and I think that was like, I think part of it was when you do the kind of disappearing act he did, all sorts of things happen, and one is no one knows what you look like, which becomes, maybe that's great, but it's also strange when you have to sort of re-enter orbit and be part of the planet again, uh, and I think this I think when I listened to the music, I I kind of loved what I heard, and I still I listen to Chinese Democracy today. I saw again. your tweet, yeah, yeah, and I've always I love so many of the songs. There is at the same time there's something so fascinatingly weird about the record because it is dislodged from any external reality, and it was like. He's a guy who, and like the same guy who wanted to talk about Pet Shop Boy production was a guy who had spent, I think he spent a decade trying to make a record that was relevant to a series of musical changes that he outlasted. So but by the time he put the record out, everything he was responding to had come and gone. And what he didn't realize was Guns N' Roses as one of the greatest bands of all time and worthy of a podcast by you and all of that, <laughs> that he didn't have to really respond. Like that's like the Stones in their entire career, like, okay, maybe Miss You responded to disco for a song or whatever. But a lot of bands did that, short kiss. Yeah, yeah but, but when you're a great band, 
the truth is people want guns and roses. And that to me was sort of, when I listen to Chinese democracy today, I'm thinking like, in retrospect, because of the way the record was received so strangely, that like what everyone said, and I think I hinted it in this article, is like, if he had just called it Axl Rose and it made it the coolest solo album of all time, it probably would have been better for the reception of the record. Like, I've never seen a record with a weirder reception because when it eventually came out, like you had to go to like Best Buy to get it. Yeah, I went you, the, the, the day it went, it came out. Right. And, or there was like a Diet Pepsi promotion. And there was uh, like Dr. Pepper, which, you know, they, they kind of joked about it. And then he came back with a lawsuit. And it just, I think they eventually just, because it was free press for them. And, but uh, GNR or Axel didn't take too kindly uh, to yes. that story. And he was still this great guy. And I'm sure he still is this great guy, but it was this thing of like, he had been like the good, like I just finished a project with Ringo Starr, a book that he put out. And what Ringo always says is we were lucky. Elvis was unlucky because when you're in a band, there's three other guys who know exactly what you've gone through. And that has the impact of driving people crazy being in a band, but it also keeps you honest and keeps you rooted in some reality. And I think what the Chinese democracy thing showed is when you can do anything, when you can live any way and make your own rules about how much money you're going to spend and how much time you're going to spend, you can become unconnected to the rest of the world. And that doesn't always serve you well because the songs are great, but there is something very, uh, you know, it's, been, it's like he wrote a song on there, there's Catcher in the Rye, and it's a little like J.D. Salinger, like you can be the greatest writer in the world, but if you go off into the woods too long, you can get lost in a certain way. And that record is both brilliant and I love the record, but it's also very weird because it doesn't, it, it's, it's like, and I, I think of it a lot sonically, it's a hard record to connect to. You can't even, like when you hear it, it's almost like he spent so many years doing different electronic touches or remixes and having 45 producers and 35 guitarists and every, you know, in, in the end, it's like, it's so perfect that it, it's almost not a human, it's, not, it's hard for a human to hear it because it's not, it's like the, some of the greatest records of all time were like a jazz blue note recording, a guy went to Hackensack and got in a living room and played for 10 minutes. And it's, it's, it, you have a sense of place and a sense of time. And I think that record doesn't have much of, it's great songs and really psychologically fascinating songs, but it's also a weird recording. And now I'll stop with the filibuster and answer questions. <laughs> you know, I can listen to you all day. I mean, I've been reading you for, for so long. So uh, it's just great to, to get all- I apologize for anything I wrote. No, because it, it's so great because I, I can sense your excitement to come on. You're like, I can't wait to talk about my one of my favorite bands, how much they mean to me. And I was like, just keep going, David, just keep going. But yeah, there's a lot of things to unpack to what you said. Yeah, there's a lot you can compare. In my head, I'm thinking like what GNR shifted to with Chinese democracy. People had that uh, that complaint with User Illusion, adding a backing, a backing band, the, the backing band that we love so much. You know, it's not the same down, dirty, gritty Guns N' Roses, you know, they're doing but this grand thing. But with Chinese, you described it perfectly. It is a great record. I love it, but it's weird. But the the big thing is, and you touched on a lot of it in that 2000 article that I retweeted and shared, that you ask Axel, why didn't you name it just Axel? Why is it not a solo record? And he felt that it was it was a band. Right. He, that's, that's what he at least said at, as, at the time. Obviously, since then, though, that band at the time is was no more. You know, the, the Buckethead, Paul, Tobias, Paul, Hughie, you know, uh, that that version of GNR didn't didn't last too, too long. But it's 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 fascinating. Like, so if you listen to it this morning and again, that article, that 2000 article where you were listening to it and that was before, I think, was that you can tell me the 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 guns of roses leaks the leaks that happened the chinese democracy leaks that was not 
that did not happen until like the few years leading up to the actual release in 2008. So what did yeah. you, so like, what did you hear, I guess, and compared to what came out eight years later? I think that's probably the biggest question because in there, a couple of uh, uh, things to note, you said a great song, the blues, which was redone, which uh, a little bit, of course, renamed street of dreams in Oklahoma, which, um, one of my listeners said became like another song, but it never came out. It's just all th these leaks that came out in 2019. You maybe you heard some of those. So what did you hear? Is was there any difference between the final product and what you heard? What I heard, I cannot, I can't fathom a reality where you could spend another six weeks, much less eight years or whatever eight, it was, eight you know, years. I, I don't, there was, it, it wasn't like any, what I, what I love on the record, I loved in the studio that day. And I think it was not about needing more time to finish it. What it was, I think was, again, just my opinion is it was all trying to justify that it, this is Guns N' Roses. And the thing is, it is, a lot of what we've always loved about Guns N' Roses is Axel. He is one of the most talented people. He's one of the greatest, he's the great rock star of my, you know, coming up era at, in journalism and all that. He was the guy. I I witnessed, like, when I think of the peak of, I didn't see the Stones at their peak, but I saw Guns N' Roses explode, and it was magnificent. It's everything you wanted a great band to be. Even the outrageous stuff that makes me uncomfortable, even like the song that seems racist, even the song that seems homophobic. I'm not defending any of that, but it was reflective. It was sort of like living through everything I didn't get to live through with the stones and the outrages there or the sex pistols. Right, right. And in a weird way, they were the sex pistols and the stones for exactly my years, my sort of post-college era. And I'm I'm so glad I like I remember seeing them at Rock and Rio. And I I can literally, I think I almost got killed that day because uh I think a, a, a Brazilian security guard, somehow I didn't have the right pass to be where I was because some rock star had pushed me in. I believe Billy Idol and Tony Dimitriotis, who was his manager, like literally they took Billy's uh, pass off of him and put it on me to stop a guy from punching me a second time. Uh, it was, I mean, Rio was wild. It was, you know, it was, but seeing Guns N' Roses and that sort of ruling the earth, at their sort of commercial peak, it was magnificent. And, you know, I did feel connected to it. Like Axel thanked me on Use Your Illusion, I, I, which was incredibly nice of him. I, in retrospect, I would have gotten more attention if I, he'd included, uh, you know, instead of Bob Guccione, if he'd put me in Get In The Ring, like maybe <laughs> I could have been the, you know, in the ring with the two of them, I would have gotten, I, I was, would have gotten more attention. I was just about to say, I was thinking about it when you mentioned before about the, like the forms you had to fill out for, to, to get an interview with them, you know, the, with approval and in my head, I'm like, who did I interview? Who also had said that? I think it was Bob Guccione Jr. Who I had on, who, who said the same thing. I mean, so we're talking about like the, that's what I was amazed because you talk about the disconnect and that's what a lot of people feel with Chinese democracy. Not everybody, because there are, I've spoken to fans on this very podcast. You became fans of the band through Chinese. Like you, you, they tend to go on the younger side, but I think that's, that's great. You know, however you get into good music, it doesn't matter. But I, I, I how did you like, I, I guess, how did like Axel, I guess, received the interview that you did because he was very open and honest. And I'm reading it and I'm like, wow, if I if I said some of these things on a podcast, I, I feel like I would get, you know, somebody would tell me that management was they always yell at me through somebody else or not always like a couple of times I've gotten scolded through somebody else for like clickbait that's out of my control. So that that's now that's too, that's, you know, the last few years. But in, in the year 2000, <laughs> sorry, I guess had the uh, the coning. Uh, remember that uh, in the year 2000? Sorry, I, uh, I'm on medication. It's OK. So, like, how did the, the band receive that interview? Because it was very 
Axel is very forthright and honest, which the band, they, they don't talk now. And I, I guess I probably know better than anybody that the band doesn't talk now because I, I want them to talk on this show. I, I, all I remember of the article was, you know, uh, I'm literally getting a, uh, I'm a rock star wife is texting me every 10 seconds. I don't know how to turn off my phone. No, it's all right. You um, can say I that, apologize. You, know, you know, let's say so, like any Axel stories you, you want to uh, share. Yes. Uh, I, stop. Um, what I remember was a getting home from the studio at five 30 in the morning. Uh, and my kids were really young and my, me- my very strong memory of the next, that day is I closed my eyes looking at it, it said five 54. And I then heard a cry that woke me up at five 55. So it was, <laughs> and it was literally like getting up, changing a diaper and it was a night I slept one minute. Axel, like, and I realized, I don't think Axel is going back to the mansion and getting up a minute later. I think he's, I think he sort of sleeps in and then he shows up at the studio at a late hour. I remember that. that. Uh, I don't remember getting much reaction. I mean, I think the article got attention because he hadn't been seen and people didn't believe, you know, right. Some people were suspicious of the whole adventure, but it was all, it was all true. The, Strange thing is that after that, I think I, and it's hard for me to keep the timeline right. I had a bunch of encounters. I ran into Axel at a farmer's market. <laughs> uh, I, I wrote the MTV awards when he came back with the new band to sort of try to do their first show. Mm-hmm. And I remember Jimmy Fallon, it was like the first big award show we ever hosted and it ended up I did the Emmys with him years later and it was sort of a big night for him and it was this thing of like I was you know uh, we're at Radio City and uh, Axel came in and I was the only person he recognized because he's sort of already been sort of removed from the world of journalism and I happen to be there as a writer on the show I want to talk about that night I don't want to cut you off but I don't well yeah my memory is they rehearsed and were great and then like a lot of things that go wrong in TV, there was something about the way he sound checked. Like there was some, he wanted to do something differently and sonically and the sound check was great. And then the show was not, I think Madagascar, he did like, I forget which two songs, but two early classics. It and was, then Madagascar uh, in the middle. Yes, it was, it was uh, yeah, in the middle. It was uh, what, Welcome to the Jungle, Madagascar and then Paradise City to end it. Sorry, yeah. I, I remember watching that because I was, I don't know, a uh, sophomore in college, you know, I was watching it with my then girlfriend in the, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm telling this. I told this in early, early podcast episodes. I'm still living at home. We're like in the, you know, den fooling around, whatever we have it on in the background. And then all of a sudden we hear Jimmy Fallon go, it goes with the roses. And then we stop what we're doing. And then like, we just want, you know, because we were such guns and roses fans. <laughs> we, we always decided to watch, uh, Watch that. I so obviously I don't forget that night for a variety of reasons. Yeah, well, that was um, what I do. What I mean, I've now spent that was the beginning of my career in TV and music shows with, especially with TV. Uh, and the thing is about being on TV is you have to go into the system and work with it. You can't try to reinvent how music is done on TV. And I think Axel, as always, was pushing to do something like really uh sonically in the recording and it it i don't i don't think it was his fault i'm sure it was that the somehow the production failed him but i do remember he didn't sound great for the first song and maybe for the third but i loved madagascar and thought that sounded great uh but it, it wasn't did. as great as a rehearsal if you if i would like to have the tape of the sound check where they so would, sounded great well the fans would want that too uh but I didn't notice anything when I first saw it. I was just so like, cause I, I hadn't seen this as, as somebody as young as I am at, especially at that time. I'm like, I've never seen Axel. He was how, you know, uh, Howard Hughes to me. I'm like, I, I, he's, he's a real person. Oh my God. Uh, but how did was that? Cause we had Sally Fertini on who I believe was the executive. Yeah, Sally, yeah. So how was that kept a secret? How did you get him on after all those years? How did he like, like how did that even materialize because that just the secrets like that are not kept anymore 
That's what used to be great about MTV and just TV in general. Like that was just, whoa, like that. Those moments don't happen anymore. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, what, what, the, the, sorry, what, I didn't notice it. But I, it, I was catching my, up in my brain. My other thought. I will say this. I've been awake since uh, three thirty because this morning I had to cover. Well, long story short, I was working at Q one hundred four three this morning producing it. So it's like long ass day. So <laughs> it's okay. I I don't want to come off as stu- any more stupid than I normally come off. <laughs> no, no, believe me. No, I'm I'm pleased to have a forum to talk about this stuff because. It was so important in my my rock and roll history because but, I spent my life covering things that already happened. And Guns N' Roses was really the band I saw happen and, you know, got to in some way feel connected to it. And then, you know, again, like I said, like Jake Tapper came and I talked about Axel. The thing is, Axel never likes you talking about Axel, but I, yeah. well, I'm, I'm happy to do it because I just want to say how much I love what he brought to rock and roll. And even the stuff I don't like that he did, even the insanity of Chinese democracy, the part of it that is the Howard Hughes, like losing a connection. I kind of love all of it because it's sort of like, you know, I, it's like my chance to have witnessed like Brian Wilson, not finishing smile. It was, you know, all of it is magnificent. Now I want to just, I'll, uh, my last sort of story, which is a reason I, I feel a little sad about, because I did weirdly, I would hear from Axel every once in a while or run into him every once in a while. Then um, I think the last time I had a dealing with him, uh, and this probably was something I did wrong, but I got a call, I think 2009, by weird coincidence, I was in the hospice, my dad was dying, and I got a call saying, Axel wants you to apologize, and I, now he didn't know where I was. No, of course not, but the, of course not. But, but it was, what he want. I said, what am I supposed to apologize for? Because I'd never had, I'd never, in my mind, done anything wrong. And there was an article that had run years earlier in Rolling Stone, not by me, <laughs> an article I had nothing to do with. And he wanted me to apologize for the article. And that's sort of, again, when I think about what I think those lost years, because we now have this thing where Axel has come back and become the most responsible rock star in the world. The guy <laughs> who made every date with ACDC and every date yeah. on the tour, which I saw and really, really loved. But this was the moment Same. where he was so lost and isolated. And he asked me to apologize for an article I had nothing to do with. And I wrote back to them, uh, please tell Axel I apologize. I'm sorry he's fucking bothering me when it's my father is dying. I would have said and, the same. And, uh, and I'm not you know ashamed of it, but it was probably not the way they wanted to be spoken to. But, but look at where was, you were at that time. They should, I, you should be understood at that time that you're grieving. What kind of answer are you supposed to get? You know? Well, well that was the answer I gave. And I don't think I've, and I didn't, uh, like, I remember when I heard about the, oh, and then I should say, in the intervening years, I had dealings with all the other guys. I should, I guess, again, if I'm saying too much, you tell me. But like, uh, like, what are you like? What are you saying too much? Because for me, uh, you've already lived my for a variety of reasons. You lived your dream. Uh, even before this podcast, I've, I've I said to friends growing up, if I ever interview Axl Rose, I'll retire. Like that's it. There's nothing I can do, and this is kind of like what we're talking. It's lead. It's it's great. We're the same. It's leading to where my thought was going and what we were talking about off air at the beginning of this, uh, and even talking about your your interview. It's like I'm so used to them not talking or when people do talk, it's not received well. Um, and I'm, I'm generalizing, too, you know, for the most part. It's, it's you know, Axel, I mean, uh, Slash and Duff, they can they promote their own projects. Everything is fine. But from my experience, you know, the GNR people don't talk. Everything is so close knit. Uh, we're talking about ACDC, Brian Johnson. What did he say last year when he had to sign like an NDA? He couldn't talk about the new record. He felt like he was like a liar. So I'm like, that just made me think of like, that's what GNR is. My listeners are amazed and you're amazed that I've been able to 
put out over 250 episodes when the band doesn't hasn't made new music. And I thought about this with your article. They were supposed to put out new music that year in 2000. Didn't come out in two, until 2008 and haven't put out original music since. And Whoa. it's like, how yeah. do you do interviews? How do you connect with a fan base? How do you connect with your... So it's just, uh, especially with you when you were friendly with him. I can understand big, bad media. You know, people are, you know, Bob Guccione Jr. or people that you want to call them out and get the ring. But you, when you had like a good relationship, it's a... It's, uh, I don't know. I'm, I feel I'm taking it personally for you, to be, to be honest with you, because you have nothing but good things to say about him. Well, here's the thing. In the That's my years, rant. <laughs> yeah, no, no. In the intervening years, I got to know the other guys in a variety of ways. I went on the road with them with Sebastian. When Skid Row were opening, I was on the road and got to know. And then when I started doing all these TV shows, I did you know, at the Grammys, Velvet Revolver were our backing band for a version of Across the Universe. So I worked with them, like actually breaking down vocal parts with Brian Wilson and Alicia Keys and Bono and Stevie Wonder and got to know them in a lot of different ways. Did another show with Slash in Vegas. And all I can tell you is in those moments, I realized these are fantastic guys. Like Slash is unbelievably charming to the point where I'd already had some of those experiences when I went in the studio with Axel. And he, at one point off, the, I think off the record, he said, slash is evil. And I went, I laughed. I said, I got to tell you, Axel. And again, I think when you're cut off from the world, you can have no one ever confront you with anything other than your point of view. Like if you have a band that's on payroll, they're probably not going to tell you you're wrong about anything. And I'm not exactly the most aggressive journalist perhaps, but when he said something about Slash, I said, I got to tell you, you're wrong. I've been around him in recent years, which he had not. I said, he's a charming guy. I think he was fucked up. I think that's, you know, what whatever the, that you were dealing with those. And again, I find these bands, like the greatest bands, they still go back to like, I, this is true in my dealings with Van Halen or the Beatles. They never, in a certain ways, those things, a lot of their impressions are rooted in early, early time together. So that, yeah. you know, those issues. That's don't life in general. Away. Sometimes I feel like my mom looks at me like I'm still, uh, you know, like a little boy. Oh, I guess that's the way moms are. But I know what oh, you no. mean. Eddie Van Halen, uh, who, you know, I spent time with a lot of time with. He, he still talked about David Lee Roth like, you know. He was the rich kid in Pasadena who lived in a big house, you know, and those class things get into it. But with Guns N' Roses, the issues that were early on, you know, uh, I think in a weird way, all those issues are the reason they don't talk because they have kept, they, they know, and this is maybe a very responsible thing, they are now know how to keep the band on the road uh, when there's a road to be on right now. Yeah. You know, but they they were they turned into that you know they were giving the people what they wanted and keeping the band together. Now, as when I went to that show, to me, there's a little bit. It's it's it was fantastic. I still look at them and I don't feel a hundred percent a total band energy. I think Axel took charge and is in charge, and you know, and in a way, maybe that's. I, I I only recently kind of realized how much the title Chinese democracy, I always was like reading politics into it and a social statement. Right. But I think in retrospect, and I think he gave a quote maybe to me that I, I just finally got like years, you know, all these years later, it's like, he, I think he said something like, it might be ironic. And it is ironic because what I think it was a statement of is Guns N' Roses is a Chinese democracy, which is to say it is not a democracy at all. It was, he needed to be the chairman and the, he needed to be the dictator of the band. And I still feel that. And that's, that's like what happened to me about Guns N' Roses is it was a guy who, because of whatever issues he had grown up with and whatever, you know, the dynamics in the band and the drugs and chemical sort of confusion of, that era in rock and roll, he was a guy who realized I can't have this be a democracy. It has to be a Chinese democracy. And that only hit me in recent times that that, I think that's what it's all about. You just blew my mind. You just blew my mind. I don't think I'm going to listen to that record the same way ever again. 
I'm just like it. Wow. Wow. But you're, you're right. And I hate that you're right with just why they're smart and they keep it together. But again, it's, you say that you just work with Ringo Starr. Isn't there something about just connecting and understanding, you know, your audience and, and the, what the music about, it doesn't leave things up for interpretation. You know, isn't there something to, you know, whether or not he wants to, you know, I'm not saying talk to me. I don't have that kind of ego. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm, I consider myself honored to be talking to David Wilde. I mean, uh, Axl Rose interview happens in my, in my, my dreams. Today I'm higher. <laughs> you are, but it, it's like, what do you think? Again, this is all opinion speculation. Like, could here, here, can't yeah, there be here. a balance to well, it? Well, here's what I think. I think like you cut to the Grammys a week or so ago, you know, I called, <laughs> I, I reached out to Ringo and said, I want you to present the last award. Now he's 80 years old. <laughs> you notice that the Grammys were rather dominated by young artists because when you're filming with other humans at this point in history, you wanna be very careful. And I actually, I wrote him, uh, I wrote him a long sort of Jerry Maguire email at four in the morning, cause we were working around the clock. And I said, here's what you would do. You could leave your house at, you know, eight o'clock and you could come down. It would be a total hour and 50 minutes. You drive into the parking lot, you present the Grammy, you go home, you wave at me. You don't have to, and he actually, he, he agreed immediately. He was so gracious about it because he is, he knows who he is. He's comfortable with who he is and he loves connecting. And if you watch the Grammys, you saw him like he and Billie Eilish and her brother having this moment where like, she goes, what's up Ringo? And him, the brother, I, I, I think it's good to connect and reach out, but there are exceptions. I think of David Bowie, who I, I work with a lot. I wrote a lot of like his bios for him. And I wrote about him in the Rolling Stone before that. Uh, I was in documentaries that he asked me to be in. He was one of the greatest, again, another of the, maybe the greatest artist I ever, you know, a pure artist. He, when he had a health scare, cut out press. He just, he didn't do anything at a certain point, you know, late in his life. I never spoke to him again. And I had spoken to him every year, at least for like many years. But I, and I thought that was right because at a certain point when he almost, I think when he felt a brush with his, you know, his, his death, uh, he said, I'm not, I'm going to cut out, I'm just going to do the art and I'm not going to do the press. I thought that was, I, even though it was kind of sad for people like me, I think it was the right thing to do. Agreed. I think, I think Axel might be, have come to know himself clearly. And again, I'm not saying this based on any recent conversations. No. I've had none. But I think when I see what he pulled off with ACDC and with Guns N' Roses, I think maybe he knows that he is such a control freak, whatever his trauma that he had as a young person, that it has left him, you know, in fact, that's what Chinese democracy, you listen to it. It's like, it's like a, a it's a soundtrack of traumas. It's about relationship. Huh. You know, he seemed traumatized by his relationship with Stephanie Seymour, it seems, you know, there was all sorts of pain in there, but whatever his psych, whatever he's come to realize about himself, maybe he knows that engaging in, you know, the press and engaging in popular consciousness in that way, it distracts him. It makes him, maybe he can't do that and deliver the goods because he, God knows he delivers the goods like no one has shown up. He for does time. when it happens. He yeah. does. <laughs> and but maybe he can't, maybe he knows himself enough to know yeah. he can't do that. And the other thing that said, he also like, I am cheer him on the social media. Axel is amazing. <laughs> to me. I love it. I do uh, love it too. Yeah, I love and I, his, his politics. It's like, I always thought I had different politics from him. I have now feel very much connected <laughs> to him politically. I love when he sort of, taken some stands i love the weird stuff when he shows up in that animated show or whatever yeah That's yeah i love that the only i do thing, too yeah the only thing i do regret is i i know and i heard on your podcast you know i think it was duff's wife talking about there's this new music yeah. i did think in the midst of the pandemic and i'm you know you know I guess Axel's kind of my age, but I grew up loving Bob Dylan and he clearly, you know, he did knock it on heaven's door. Right. 
Bob Dylan in the middle of the pandemic, like put out this amazing music that sort of helped me. It somehow, it, and I, I wish that Axel, I wish there was one song and maybe I'm sure it's going to come out. I, you know, but God knows when with him, but like <laughs> we could have used, we could have used one song that, you know, uh, in the middle of the pandemic. But I think that's the problem is people like you or me demanding anything of him never has worked. He needs to do it on his terms. I think he can only be guns and roses on his terms. And he, he pulled it off against every odd. I didn't think this could happen. And look, it, it happened. So he's right for him. And I was wrong thinking, <laughs> it, you know, he actually has made, and Jimmy Ivey was also right, is it's only really Guns N' Roses if Slash is there. It's the Mick and Keith rules of rock and roll. You need, you need the guy leaning on you, although they don't seem to lean on each other as much. But I think they do. That, right. But the, that's the photographic evidence. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, it, there's so again, there's so much to unpack, man. You you have to, and I'm, we're not going to exactly wrap up just yet, David. But I I want to have you back on again because there's so much to to talk about uh, with you. Sure. Uh, but with with Axel, you're right, and that's why. Because I guess if you listen to so many of my episodes, which I'm so flattered by, you know, because I don't know if you know, because my my undergrad was broadcast journalism. I I, I wished I I became you. But I, I I was an idiot. I wish that became me too. <laughs> I'm like, oh, radio, that's cool. I mean, yeah, I'm very, I'm very knock on wood, love radio, but it's not, you know, I'm not Howard Stern. It's it's not the most lucrative uh, business, but I get to do cool things like this. But with Axel, that's why I talk about mental health a lot, and that's why it, it attracted me to Guns N' Roses in the band. I identified with the lyrical content, the depressing lyrics, the anger. You know, that's why I wasn't completely emo. I needed the Axl Rose anger. I needed the, the grit of the 80s combined with the, the grand stuff like November Rain and, and a Strange. That's that's so I, I, I get that part of it, but it's just the no music like update. That's what I think fran, fans get frustrated by. And me, I, I, I do my I feel like I have your approach. You know, a bit. I'm not the most hard hitting journalist. That's not what I want to be. I want people to come back on my show. You know, I, it's, but I'm also not going to be a kiss ass. I'm going to be real. But I think more often than not, I'm going to be somebody called me the, uh, what the, the Sweden of like the Guns N' Roses community or whatever. It's like someone who's completely neutral. And I do my best with that. Um, but with, with, it's just like, it's just like with, they, there's been nothing during the pandemic and you who've known him for so long and, has been, a, has been following his career for obviously longer than I have. Yes, this would have been a perfect time to do it. Bucket has been obviously releasing, still releasing, you know, 20 albums a year. And I just don't know why. You know, there, there are rumors, you know, me, I have to be involved or at least have my ear to the ground with these forums that perhaps Fernando on Reddit said it was supposed to come out last year, but it got stopped with by the pandemic. So I'm holding my hope for when the tour supposedly resumes uh in what australia and uh, new zealand those are the dates that you know the world is allowing right now for concerts at least full concerts yeah the last interview i did before the pandemic was with uh neil finn from crowded house okay about a tour he was about to go on in a few weeks and then he just that was like march of last year and then i just saw they actually are in new zealand i think in new zealand doing those shows i believe or australia so it is beginning to happen. I, it can't happen soon enough. But I, I, I want to say, as much as we want this stuff from Axel, I think what you realize is there are some people who are utterly unique. Axel is one of the most uniquely talented individuals I've ever met. Doug, you know, I think Doug often, like he comes on your show and he speaks very well of him. It's not, he's not bullshitting you. He's like, not bullshitting because no, he's I, told me, uh, forgive me, Doug, if you haven't said this publicly, but he's told me that Axel has told him to stop saying nice things about him because he doesn't like saying, he doesn't like people talking nice about him, but Doug's like, you know what? Fuck you. I want to be nice about you. People need to know who the real Axel is, which is what I, you're doing, which well, is no, exactly I, what you're doing. I, I have to say, I found the guy so interesting, intelligent, genuine in terms of his I think when I think of him and I think of like the last time 
you know, in the, that time in Rio, they were the last band of rock and roll that unironically tried to do everything. They tried to, they were as, you know, and I would think it was his ambition slash as well. But I think more than anything, it's like when you listen to like November Rain, he was going for it. He was trying to do everything Elton John did, everything the Beatles did. He was going for it in the biggest possible way. And then a second later, like I moved here in 91 uh, and I went to Geffen Records and they played me some Guns N' Roses and they played me this new band called Nirvana. Okay. And little did I know that that was like, again, they were label mates. And it was like on that one little stretch, that's where everything turned. And they're like, but I think you that's when I think back to Chinese democracy, Axel was such a believer in the church of rock and roll. Like, I don't know what other churches had let him down, but I think rock and roll was the guy's religion. I think it was, it meant everything to him. He believed in it unironically. So like whatever he said about Kurt Cobain or whatever the feud was, I think he, as a true believer in rock and roll, spent like a decade of his life or more trying to respond to Nirvana, respond to Nine Inch Nails. I think all of this really connected with him. And he probably drove himself and his label and bandmates crazy trying to chase something that he didn't really need to chase. Because all along, Axl Rose has always been his own thing, his own, you know, uh, he didn't need to chase any trend. But I think that's also, it's proof of his artistic sincerity. And I just like, yeah, I, I have to say, if he'd never come back and never pulled this off, I'd still like him, but I'm so moved by what he was able to do. Like, it's like, uh, uh, I don't want to, you know, I actually won't say it, but like, I, I just think it's a success story. Yeah, like, he, a, little, a little redemption. It's not like he was uh, totally uh, the, the cast aside or something like that, but, you know, someone like him and, you know, given your, uh, your, your resume that the, the press isn't very kind to. You know, and or just has him in a certain light. And then, you know, people that that's just all of a sudden, that's the narrative of people who've never fans that never met him. And for him to really change that, including with Chinese democracy, he was really, in my opinion, set up to fail or like had every opportunity to completely bomb. And while it had a weird reception, I consider it a, a success because it could have been a disaster given how long. It was again, eight years just since your article to when it eventually came out. But when he does the cartoon stuff, I love it. You know, as someone who still watches cartoons and I'm like, keep doing things like that. That is great. It's just we want another David Wild year 2000 moment where he's giving somebody. Yes, it was great that Susan Holmes McKagan said in my podcast that she heard bits and boops, but we want an article like yours in 2021 that is so in depth about what you heard. And uh, it's it just it's such an insight. Like you were just, obviously you're, you're, you seem like somebody who is very modest and uh, humble of just how lucky and the like, opportunities that you've had. And it's just, I'm reading it. And I'm just like, what a, what a, to be, you really made me feel like a fly in the wall in that room at that. And just like unbelievable. Just to think about a 36 year old Axel Rose, soon putting out trying soon is the word air quote that he said well, on the no, thank you for all the uh, thanks for all the nice words i do remember i think there's a line yeah there's a line in there where i say are you committing to putting it out in the next century yeah like in the, in the 20th and i was joking because i was being told by all the you know everyone said it's coming out in the next six months and that's why why else would he have done the interview i think right uh, that's what i was you know, thinking i'm like why would he do this interview and then not put it out for eight years yeah. And I, I just I do remember thinking he wanted to wait to the worst possible time. <laughs> if you're it, it, it was, I think, like every trend that he had been dealing with was already over by the time he got there. And the answer was all people wanted was guns and roses. And to a certain extent, what they wanted was the sense of a band that they got when he and Ax, when he and Slash stood on a stage together and that's you know that again i think he i i i can't criticize him because i think whatever his journey took a million 
million weird turns, but he got there and he's yeah. become, he's become the, he, you know, in, a, in an era when so many rock gods are dying, it's good that he came back to us. We need every legendary band, you know, cause he, he, you know, God willing, he, and, you know, you know, and the guys can be out there on the road for another 15 years once stages are available to us. And we're not going to have, you know, the stones forever. And we need, uh, we need our great, you know, rock gods to uh, continue on for us. I know really. And, and if anything, I just wanted more uh, like live concerts to watch online. And they gave us some YouTube on not in this lifetime select, but I guess since you're a fan of this podcast, which sounds weird to say, You've heard me complain about that uh, my girlfriend's constantly or fiance is constantly watching uh, Dave Matthews live events. I'm like, why can't GNR do this? I, I'm sorry if you're a Dave Matthews person. I respect him. It's just, I don't know. It's too think, much for I, me. Yeah, it's too much. Think, too much think, Dave Matthews for me. I can't handle no, it. The answer is some people can, no one else can do what Axl Rose does. <laughs> uh, and he can only do it on his own terms. And you know, if that had stopped him in 1994 from ever doing anything, he's still done a lot. He's still given us some great recordings. But the truth is, the last couple of years before the pandemic locked it, locked down live music, no one was doing more to keep the flame of rock and roll going than than he did. He really was. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and in ways that I didn't expect, like I did not expect to be hearing Wichita linemen <laughs> by, by Guns N' Roses. And uh, I, I, it doesn't mean we don't want more from him and I want a new album. Uh, but like, listen, he not only outlasted a lot of doubters and a lot of people who said shitty things about him along the way, he's outlasted the album as a format, which, you know, it's like, and I, I, I can only imagine, you know, this is a guy who was, you know, his experience with Chinese democracy. I wonder what, if that goes into it at all, like, do you want to put on an album in an era where albums are really just commercials for tours? Right. Or it's just something even like I loved not only when he did Looney Tunes, but when he put out rock, the rock, the song, do things like that. I have no problem, but I think it's, because of how talented and creative he is and what he's put out. He's like, a, a, if you're a sports guy, he's like a Jim Brown or a Barry Sanders. He's, you know, he's shines bright. He could shine bright for a little bit, but he came back, you know, and like, uh, you know, those guys. But so you j just fans like want more. I think it was, oh, I want to say who, who said this. It might've been Alice Cooper or it's like, it's, it's a compliment when fans want new stuff from you. Like you should be flattered, I guess. There are fans that go overboard. Yes, 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 that are demanding it. Yeah, I'd like to think that, I, hey, Axel, I, I just want to hear your voice. Whether it's, <laughs> I just want to hear your voice. Whether it's in a cartoon, I, I prefer a song, but I just want to hear more of you. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, many years after he thanked me, I have come on to realize, I just want to say, I thank him for what he has given us. I hope he gives us more, but it's on his, let him do what he wants to do, because I don't think he is constitutionally capable of doing it any other way. I think if he was running his career to make the maximum money, I mean, I used to go on a, a different podcast, Adam Carolla, who would always say, no one ever left more money on the table than Guns N' Roses. Like, think of all the years they weren't making all that money. Sure. Uh, and, I, but, yeah. and, I, and I remember I was in the studio with Velvet Revolver. I did like work with them around, you know, wrote their bio for their first record. And I watched them and I remember thinking like, this is great. But again, it was always like anybody, you can't start thinking about what's not happening. I think you can't think about the records you don't get. I see. I think, I think it is more worth celebrating the records you do get. Like, I still think there's a lot of people who've never actually given Chinese democracy a fair shot and wrote it off. And like, I literally like to every once in a while, like I'll go do liner notes for a Fleetwood Mac record and I'll take this attitude of like, I'm going to go for a walk and pretend I've never heard rumors. I think I did that when I wrote the liner notes for rumors or I did a, a live record that's coming out in a week or two for Fleetwood Mac. But I did that today. It was that way for Chinese democracy. I'm like, forget all my associations and all my issues and all of his issues that are all over the lyrics of that record. It's like, just hear it. Yes. And like, and you just hear it and you go, this guy is utterly unique. That's a truly unique, brilliant, 
weird ass record. <laughs> that is just, and that's in a weird way. That's why in my head, it's an Axl Rose record. I think it is, it's as direct a reflection of his, what was in his head and heart at that moment, rather than a band, you know, a band, you sort of like, you gotta reach a consensus. And I think Axel is just one of those guys who's, you know, I, I think the, again, the only democracy he can be in is a Chinese democracy. <laughs> And wow. that, and that, and that, it takes you a long time to realize you have to love people for what they are, not project what you want them to be. And we should, it's like at long last, let's let Axel be Axel. I think that's what, you know, and it, yeah, I think that's what Slash and Duff realized is like, you know, let's, let's just let this, let, let him be. And huh. look what happened as a result of that. A million, a generation gets to rediscover one of the greatest bands in rock history. You're right. Wow. A lot of things you're saying is are, are reminding me of my therapist. Just like, <laughs> just That's like... What this is. hard rock therapy. <laughs> yes. David, uh, I have just because I, I don't want to forget it. Uh, one quick question, because it, it struck me in the uh, the article. It was a song that was a, to kind of make a, a right turn. There was a song that made he said that, like, I hope Dylan eventually hears this. Do you know what that song if that came on the record? Like what oh, no, that, I don't remember that at all. Is that in the article? I got to go. I will reread it. And let uh, me, I will, um, I, I will I sh- I'll tweet sh- you when I can research that. I don't remember that. All right. Cause then I was like, whoa, cause that's, that's a lot. Cause you're right. I think there, there's a, there's a, at least my fans, like really like healthy Guns N' Roses fans that like, you know, let Axel do what he wants. I'm grateful for, for whatever, but it's like, yeah, there are some songs and a lot of artists are like this, you know, things up for interpretation. But there are a lot of things like you can't help but like it was Axel and or Slash really playing Sorry together. I thought that was about Slash. So you don't really know. Uh, let me just do this control F so I can find this easily since I do not have a producer. And because I wanted to find Dylan and I can't find Dylan there. How do I spell Dylan? <laughs> T-Y-L-A-N. Usually. All right. Oh, see, oh, now I can't log back into it because I'm not subscribed back to the well, Rolling Stone. You know I use all our, my, I use our, all my free things. <laughs> this will be our part two. We'll, we'll, we'll get at the heart of that. What's weird is I was, it's funny. It, it was exactly around that same time I wrote liner notes for Dylan, which was one of the most amazing things ever. Cause he's, he told me, don't use any adjectives, just nouns and verbs. And so what's funny is all these guys, like, have their issues, <laughs> he has linguistic sure. issues. They have their. I have my issues. Yeah, you know, and and it's like the truth is you can't really criticize Axel Rose for the issues because that's what made him Axel Rose. And I don't. That's what I, got him I, from Indiana and got him to be still someone who, if there was a, st- a arena or a stadium, we would go see him tonight. I love him for that. I think I'm just bitter that the, uh, and she was very lovely. The the harp player on Prostitute. Uh, can't be on the show because of an NDA. So I, I think I'm just bitter about that still, to be honest yeah. with you. <laughs> One of the greatest things that ever happened to me was uh, when we had Prince and Beyonce in the Grammys, Prince invited uh, the producer at Ken Ehrlich and I over and he did. we did a meeting and then we he did a private concert for us to show us what he was going to do. And at the end of it, he knew me as a journalist. Prince also thanked me around that same... I think in one year I was thanked by Prince, Axel, and new kids on the block, which shows I had range in terms of who I could get along with at that point. Now I can't get along with anyone. But, in, uh, in many years from now, yes. when you pass away, you know, in your sleep as an old, old man. Or later say, tonight. It's going to say that in her tombstone. Thank my oh, Prince. No. Trying to Please, thank no. my Axel. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to say no. that. Okay. Well, I'll tell you. And, and my new thing, kids on the block. Okay. I think, I think Axel, I, you might have it more handy. The, uh, um, the use your illusion one and two. I think that was a pure thank you. When I, we did a Prince Grammy tribute last or a year and a half ago, and I always thought Prince thanked me on the hits album. And then I went back and looked at it. And what he actually wrote was a penny for your thoughts. And I realized I never got a penny. So I think it was a joke. You know, it was a, a half a thank you and half a, maybe a nephew. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah. But Funny. listen, Again, I just want to say thank you and thank Axel and uh, and Guns N' Roses because I do think I feel like my exact life allowed me them to be the band that I got to see live the rock and roll dream 
explode and then somehow pull it together and uh, give us a surprisingly happy ending. And and just for me, I, I, I get to relive those moments through you. And yeah, I have a, a radio career, but this podcast about Guns N' Roses is just an, an Axel's music and the music has allowed me to connect with people like you. So uh, before we get out of here, anything that you want to promote out there, you know, people have, can follow you on, on Twitter, you know, yeah, just, yeah, just follow me at wild about music if you like, uh, but no, I, I, I really just, uh, I, I don't want to promote. I want to say how much I love this music. I, I kind of can't believe how much Chinese democracy connects with me now. It's like, <laughs> uh, and I, it's like, it's almost like it took, and I'm not saying we all are catching up to Axel, but I think it's almost like there's so much, there's been so much between us and Guns N' Roses. You know, they've kept such a distance that it's it's great to connect. That's what seeing them live, I hope we can all do that because this is just music that it, it it's resonated with obviously you and all the people who are listening. And uh, it still resonates with me, you know, it's like, and I'm not, you know, I'm not as, cool as Axel. I am not as a rock god, but I, I do. Uh, I feel honored uh, to have been around the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, the it, it is, it's like the, the danger of rock and roll was sort of gone by the time I got to Rolling Stone right around the time of Guns N' Roses. I think I got there in 86, but that was the least crazy era in rock and roll. That was like post rehab when it was a little full of shit. And what I actually think Guns N' Roses did was they were like the last band before Nirvana had to sort of, you know, the grunge revolution. They were the last band to mean it and not to unironically try to be all of it, to live it all. And I loved witnessing it. Well, again, David, there's so much more to talk to you about, given your your history. Thank you so much. I am just so flattered that you came on the podcast that you've listened to this show uh, you know, I'm a fan of your work. So if you like what I'm doing, it's, I, I must be doing something right. Cause I approach this podcast in my career. I used to do this all the time with my radio demos too much. Like Chinese democracy. Got to fix this. Got to fix that. Got to re-record that. I can't do that. Like I, like I said, I'm in therapy and we're working on it. So I just got to put things out in the world and it makes me feel good when it comes back. Like when people like David wild, uh, you know, kind of give me a, and I don't know. I was about to say an attaboy, but I've never said an attaboy before. But thank you. That's somewhere that's between my... an attaboy and an Adderall. I would <laughs> uh, that's no, going to be on I... my tombstone. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on, and I hope I'll talk to you again. And yeah, it's great talking to you. You got it. So that does it for this episode of Appetite for Distortion. When will you see the next one? Well, in the words of Axel Rose, once concerning Chinese democracy at the 2002 VMAs. Well, you'll see it. I don't know if soon is the word.